Collections of ancient canons contain collected bodies of canon law that originated in various documents, such as papal and synodal decisions, and that can be designated by the generic term of canons. Canon law was not a finished product from the beginning, but rather a gradual growth. This is especially true of the earlier Christian centuries. Such written laws as existed were not originally universal laws, but local or provincial statutes. Hence arose the necessity of collecting or codifying them. Earlier collections are brief and contain few laws that are chronologically certain. Only with the increase of legislation did a methodical classification become necessary. These collections may be genuine e.g., the Versio Hispanica, or apocryphal, i.e. made with the help of documents forged, interpolated, wrongly attributed or otherwise defective e.g., the Pseudo-Isidore collection. They may be official and authentic i.e. promulgated by competent authority or private, the work of individuals. The forged collections of the middle of the 9th century are treated in the article on false decretals. From the earliest to the apocryphal collections Topic. Topic. The apostolic period Topic. In the primitive Christian ages there were apocryphal collections attributed to the apostles, which belong to the genre of the church orders. The most important of these are the Doctrine of the Twelve Apostles, the Apostolic Constitutions, and the Apostolic Canons. The Apostolic Constitutions, though originally accepted throughout the Orient, were declared apocryphal in the Trullan Council of 692, they were never accepted as ecclesiastical law in the West. The Apostolic Canons 85 were, on the other hand, approved by the Trullan Council. Dionysus Exiguus, a Western canonist of the first half of the 6th century, noted that, "...many accept with difficulty the so-called canons of the Apostles." Nevertheless, he admitted into his collection the first fifty of these canons. The so-called Decretum Gelasianum, De Libris Non Recipiendis about the 6th century, puts them among the Apocrypha. From the collection of Dionysus Exiguus they passed into many Western collections, though their authority was never on one level. They were admitted at Rome in the 9th century in ecclesiastical decisions but in the 11th century Cardinal Humbert accepts only the first 50. Only two of them 20, 29, found their way into the decretals of Gregory IX. <laughs> <laughs> Papal decretals in primitive Christian centuries, the popes carried on ecclesiastical government by means of an active and extensive correspondence. We learn from a synod of the year 370, under Pope Damasus, that the minutes of their letters or decretals were kept in the papal archives. These Vatican archives have perished up to the time of Pope John VIII died 882. In the 18th and 19th centuries attempts were made to reconstruct them. During the period under discussion i.e., to the middle of the 11th century there was a constant use of the papal decretals by the compilers of canonical collections from the 6th century on. Topic. Greek collections Topic. In 451 there was quoted at the Council of Chalcedon a collection of councils no longer extant, nor has the name of the compiler ever transpired. At the beginning of the collection were then placed the decrees of Nicaea 325, subsequently the canons of Antioch 341 were included, in which shape it was known to the fathers of Chalcedon. In the latter part of the 5th century the canons of Laodicea 343-81, Constantinople 381, Ephesus 431, and Chalcedon 451, were incorporated with this ecclesiastical code, and finally, after the canons of Neocaesarea the decrees of Sardica 343-44, in which form the collection was in use during the 6th century. Though unofficial in character, it represents inclusive of 68 canons taken from the canonical epistles of St. Basil, I, three, the conciliar discipline of the Greek Church between 500 and 600. This collection was chronological in order. Towards 535 an unknown compiler classified its materials in a methodical way under 60 titles, and added to the canons 21 imperial constitutions relative to ecclesiastical matters taken from the Code of Justinian. This collection has been lost. 
Some years later, 540 to 550, Johannes Scholasticus, Patriarch of Constantinople, made use of this code to compile a new methodical collection, which he divided into 50 books. After the emperor's death, 565, the patriarch extracted from 10 of the former S constitutions, known as novelli, some 87 chapters and added them to the aforesaid collection. In this way arose the mixed collections known as nomocanons Greek nomoi, laws, canons, canons, containing not only ecclesiastical laws but also imperial laws pertaining to the same matters. The first of these was published under Emperor Maurice 582 under each title were given, after the canons, the corresponding civil laws, the Quinisext Council 695 of Constantinople, called Trullan from the Hall of the Palace in Trullo where it was held, issued 102 disciplinary canons, it included also the canons of the former councils and certain patristic regulations, all of which it considered constitutive elements of the ecclesiastical law of the East. This collection contains, therefore, an official enumeration of the canons which then governed the Eastern Church, but no official approbation of a given collection or particular text of these canons. It is to be noted that the Apostolic See never fully approved this council. In 787 a similar recapitulation of the ancient canons was made by the Second Council of Nicaea. Italo-Latin collections Topic. Topic. Latin version of the canons of Nicaea and Sardica Topic. The former council 325 was held in repute throughout the West, where its canons were in vigour together with those of Sardica, the complement of the anti-Arian legislation of Nicaea, and whose decrees had been drawn up originally in both Latin and Greek. The canons of the two councils were numbered in running order, as though they were the work of but one council a trait met with in divers Latin collections, which explains why the Council of Sardica is sometimes called oecumenical by earlier writers, and its canons attributed to the Council of Nicaea. The oldest versions of these canons quoted in the papal decretals are no longer extant. Topic. The Hispania, or Isidoriana, version. Topic. Towards the middle of the 5th century, perhaps earlier, there appeared a Latin version of the aforesaid canons of Nicaea, Ancyra, Neocaesarea and Gangra, to which were added a little later those of Antioch, Laodicea and Constantinople. The canons of Sardica were inserted about the same time after those of Gangra. Bickel considers it possible that this version was made in northern Africa, while Walter inclines to Spain, it is now generally believed that the version was made in Italy. It was long believed, however, that it came from Spain, hence the name of Hispania or Isidoriana, the latter term derived from its insertion in the collection attributed to Saint Isidore of Seville see below, Spanish collections, in which it was edited, of course according to the text followed by the Spanish compiler. Topic. The Prisca or Atala version Topic. This too seems to have grown up gradually in the course of the 5th century, and in its present shape exhibits the aforementioned canons of Ancyra, Neocaesarea, Nicaea, Sardica, Gangra, Antioch, Chalcedon and Constantinople. It came to be known as Atala, from the place of its origin, and as Prisca, because of an overhasty conclusion that Dionysus Exiguus referred to it in the preface of his first collection when he wrote. Laurentius offended by the confusion that reigned in the ancient version, Prisco Versiones. Topic. Collectio Canonum Quasneliana Topic. At the beginning of the 6th century there arose in Italy an extensive collection, based apparently on the Antiqua Isidoriana and the African collections, and which, besides the earliest Eastern and the African councils, includes papal decretals especially Leonine, letters of Gallican bishops and other documents. Older scholarship, beginning with the Ballerinis, argued that the Quasneliana was a Gallic collection, though one with an admittedly Roman color. More recent scholarship has argued for an Italian, possibly even Roman origin. Its name is derived from the Oratorian P. Quasnel, its first editor. 
With its focus on Chalcedon and the letters of Leo, the Quasneliana is quite obviously meant as a manifesto against the Acacian Schism, in which Eastern bishops led by Acacius, Patriarch of Constantinople, challenged the decisions of the Council of Chalcedon and the Christology set down in Pope Leo's Tomus. The compiler's principle of selection thus seems to have been any and all documents that support doctrinal unity in general and Leonine Christology in particular. Of the large chronological canon collections to have come out of the early Middle Ages, the Quasneliana is perhaps the oldest surviving collection and, after the Collectio Dionysiana and Collectio Hispania, probably the most influential. It remained a popular work well into the 9th century, particularly in Francia. Most likely this was because of the numerous papal letters it contained that dealt with disciplinary matters that retained ecclesiastical importance throughout the Middle Ages. The Quasneliana played a particularly important role in the spread of Leo's letters in Western canonistic literature, and was notably instrumental in the compilations of Pseudo Isidore for just this reason. Manuscript evidence alone indicates that the Quasneliana had a fairly wide dissemination in Gaul during the 8th and 9th centuries, though it had perhaps already found a welcome audience with Gallo Frankish bishops in the 6th century, when it may have been used as a source along with the Sanblasiana for the Collectio Colbertina, and the Collectio Sancti Mauri. By the mid 8th century, the Quasneliana had secured its place as an important lawbook within the Frankish episcopate, for whom it served as the primary source during the influential Council of Vernoy in 755. Topic. Collections of Dionysus Exiguus Topic. Further collections were called for by the increasing canonical material of the Latin West in the course of the 5th century. They were far from satisfactory. Towards 500 a Scythian monk, known as Dionysus Exiguus, who had come to Rome after the death of Pope Gelasius 496, and who was well skilled in both Latin and Greek, undertook to bring out a more exact translation of the canons of the Greek councils. In a second effort he collected papal decretals from Suritius 384-89 to Anastasius II 496-98, inclusive, anterior therefore, to Pope Symmachus 514-23. By order of Pope Hormisdas (514–23), Dionysus made a third collection, in which he included the original text of all the canons of the Greek councils, together with a Latin version of the same. But the preface alone has survived. Finally, he combined the first and second in one collection, which thus united the canons of the councils and the papal decretals. It is in this shape that the work of Dionysus has reached us. This collection opens with a table or list of titles, each of which is afterwards repeated before the respective canons, then come the first fifty canons of the Apostles, the canons of the Greek councils, the canons of Carthage 419, and the canons of preceding African synods under Aurelius, which had been read and inserted in the Council of Carthage. This first part of the collection is closed by a letter of Pope Boniface I, read at the same council, letters of Cyril of Alexandria and Atticus of Constantinople to the African Fathers, and a letter of Pope Celestine I. The second part of the collection opens likewise with a preface, in the shape of a letter to the priest Julian, and a table of titles, then follow one decretal of Suritius, twenty-one of Innocent I, one of Zosimus, four of Boniface I, three of Celestine I, seven of Pope Leo I, one of Gelasius I and one of Anastasius II. The editions met with in Vol and Justal are taken from inferior manuscripts. The Avalana Collection. Topic. It is so called because its oldest known manuscript was bought for the Abbey of Santa Croce Avellana by St. Peter Damian died 1073, probably dates from the middle of the 6th century. It follows neither chronological nor logical order, and seems to have grown to its present shape according as the compiler met with the materials that he has transmitted to us. Nevertheless, Girolamo Ballerini and Pietro Ballerini pronounce it a valuable collection because of the great number of early canonical documents nearly 200 that are found in no other collection. All its texts are authentic, save eight letters from divers persons to Peter, Bishop of Antioch. The best edition is Otto Gunther, Epistvli Imperatorvum Pontific vm Aliorvum ind ab a. CCCLXVII VSQVE ad a. DLIII Data Avalana QVAE DC TVR Collectio. 
Corpus Scriptorum Ecclesiasticorum Latinorum, Vol. 35. Vindobani, F. Tempsky, 1895. Other collections Despite the popularity of Dionysus Exiguus, which caused the previous compilations to be disused, several of them were preserved, as also were some other contemporary collections. Suffice it to mention the collection known as the Chieti, or Vaticana Regina, through which a very old and distinct version of the decrees of the Council of Nicaea has reached us. Topic. Collection of the African Church Topic. Topic. Canons of the African Councils Topic. From the Eastern Church Northern Africa received only the decrees of Nicaea 325, which it owed to Cecilianus of Carthage, one of the Nicene Fathers. The African Church created its domestic code of discipline in its own councils. It was customary to read and confirm in each council the canons of preceding councils, in which way there grew up collections of conciliar decrees, but purely local in authority. Their moral authority, however, was great, and from the Latin collections they eventually made their way into the Greek collections. The best known are, a, the canons of the Council of Carthage August, 397, which confirmed the breviarium of the Canons of Hippo 393, one of the chief sources of African ecclesiastical discipline, b the Canons of the Council of Carthage 419, at which were present 217 bishops and among whose decrees were inserted 105 canons of previous councils. <laughs> Statuta Ecclesia Antiqua in the second part of the Hispania see below, and in other collections are found, together with other African councils, 104 canons which the compiler of the Hispania attributes to a pseudo-fourth council of Carthage of 398. These canons are often known as Statuta Ecclesia Antiqua, and in some manuscripts are entitled Statuta Antiqua Orientis. Heffel maintains that in spite of their erroneous attribution, these canons are authentic, or at least summaries of authentic canons of ancient African councils, and collected in their present shape before the end of the 6th century. On the other hand, Mawson, Louis de Chesney, and Arthur Malnori believe them a compilation made at Arles in the first part of the 6th century. Malnori specifies Caesarius of Arles as their author. Topic: The Breviatio Canonum. Topic. Compiled c. 546 by Fulgentius Ferrandus, it is a methodical collection and under its seven titles disposes 230 abridged canons of Greek Hispania text and African councils. Fulgentius was a deacon of Carthage and disciple of St. Fulgentius of Ruspi. Topic. The Concordia of Cresconius Topic. Cresconius Africanus, apparently a bishop, compiled his collection about 690. It is based on that of Dionysus Exiguus, only, in place of reproducing in full each canon, it cuts it up to suit the demands of the titles used, hence its name of Concordia. Between the preface and the text of the collection the writer inserted a résumé of his work. Topic. Collections of the Spanish Church Topic. These comprise the collections that arose in the lands once under Visigothic rule Spain, Portugal, and southern Gaul. In this territory, councils were very frequent, especially after the conversion of King Recaird, and they paid much attention to ecclesiastical discipline. Such collections contain, besides the decrees of Spanish synods, the canons also of Nicaea and Sardica, accepted in the Spanish Church from the beginning, those of the Greek councils known through the Atala, and those of the Gallican and African councils, quite influential in the formation of Spanish ecclesiastical discipline. Three of these collections are important. Topic: The Capitula Martini. Topic: It is divided into two parts: one dealing with the bishop and his clergy, the other relative to the laity. In both, the author classifies methodically the canons of the councils in 84 chapters. 
He says himself in the preface that he does not pretend to reproduce the text literally, but with set purpose breaks up, abridges, or glosses the same, in order to make it more intelligible to simple people. Possibly he has occasionally modified it to suit the Spanish discipline of his time. Though much has been borrowed from Latin, Gallican and African councils, the Greek councils furnish the greater part of the canons. The capitula were read and approved at the Second Council of Braga in 572. Some writers, misled by the name, attributed them to Pope Martin I. They are in reality the work of Martin of Pannonia, better known as Martin of Braga, of which place he was archbishop in the 6th century. Their text was incorporated with the Isidoriana, from which they were taken and edited apart by Merlin and by Gaspar Loisa, and in the first volume of the oft quoted work by Vol and Justel, after collation of the variants in the best manuscripts. Topic. The Spanish epitome Topic. This is the name of the collection edited by the Ballerini from two manuscripts Verona and Luca. It has two parts, one includes the canons of Greek, African, Gallican and Spanish councils, the other divers papal decretals from Suritius to Pope Vigilius 384-555, with two apocryphal texts of Saint Clement and an extract from Saint Jerome. The compiler designedly abridged his texts, and mentions only three sources, a Braga collection, the Capitula Martini, his first chapter being a résumé of that work, an Alcala Completum collection, and one of Cabra Agrabensis. Though characterized by lack of order and exactness, the epitome interests us because of the antiquity of its sources. Mawson thinks it connected with the Codex Canonum, the nucleus of the group of collections whence eventually issued the Hispania, and of which we shall treat apropos of the latter. Topic. The Hispania or Isidoriana. Topic. This must not be confused with the above described Versio Hispanica or Isidoriana among the earlier Latin collections, and which contained only canons of Greek councils. The collection in question, like that of Dionysus Exiguus on which it is based, contains two parts. The first includes canons of Greek, African, Gallican, and Spanish councils, with some letters of Saint Cyril of Alexandria and Atticus of Constantinople, while the second has the papal decretals as found in Dionysus, together with some others, most of the latter addressed to Spanish bishops. This is the chronological Hispania. Somewhat later, towards the end of the 7th century, it was recast in logical order, by some unknown writer, and divided into ten books, which were again subdivided into titles and chapters. This is the methodical Hispania. Finally, the copyists were wont to place at the beginning of the chronological Hispania, a table of contents of the methodical collection, but with references to the text of the chronological, in this shape it was known as the Excerpta Canonum. The chronological Hispania seems to have been originally the Codex Canonum, mentioned at the Fourth Council of Toledo, 633, with later editions. In the 9th century, it was attributed, with insufficient evidence, to Saint Isidore of Seville. In spite of this erroneous attribution, the Hispania contains very few documents of doubtful authenticity. Later on, additions were made to it, the latest being taken from the 17th Council of Toledo, 694. In this enlarged form, I. E. The. Codex Canonum. The. Hispania. Was approved by Pope Alexander III as authentic, until the 13th century, its authority was great in Spain. Pseudo Isidore made a generous use of its materials. Topic. Gallican collections. Topic. Topic. Codex Carolinus Topic. The Codex Carolinus is a collection of papal decretals addressed to the Frankish rulers Charles Martel, Pippin the Younger and Charlemagne, compiled by the latter's order in 791 Patrologia Latina XCVIII, not to be confounded with the Libri Carolini, in which were set forth for Pope Adrian I various points concerning the veneration of images. Topic. English and Celtic collections Topic. 
Michael Elliott has characterized the history of canon law collections in Anglo-Saxon England as follows. Both the dissemination of canon law collections within the Anglo-Saxon Church and the study of canon law collections by Anglo-Saxon clergy were considerable indeed, even if they were not as popular as in some continental churches. Canon law collections served the Anglo-Saxon Church as indispensable disciplinary, educational, and administrative tools. Beginning in the 7th and 8th centuries, and fueled by the early Anglo-Saxon Church's strong ties to Roman models, one sees in England the considerable influence of Italian canon law collections, most notably the Collectiones Dionysiana, Sanblasiana and Quasneliana. It was particularly at York and especially at Canterbury under the guidance of Archbishop Theodore that instruction in and study of these collections appears to have been carried out with the most fervour. In the 8th century, imbued with the legal teachings of these collections, reform-minded Anglo-Saxon personnel descended on the Low Countries and the lands east of the Rhine, bringing with them the institutional framework and disciplinary models they had inherited from their Roman and Celtic mentors. These included the collections already mentioned and also copies of the Collectio Hibernensis and several different types of penitential handbooks. It was also during this time that an important redaction of the Collectio Vetus Gallica was disseminated on the continent, due in part to the activities of Anglo-Saxon personnel. This acme of Anglo-Saxon canonical scholarship exemplified from the 7th to late 8th century by such figures as Wilfred, Egbert, Boniface, and Alcuin seems to have ended sometime in the 9th century, probably as a result of the devastation of the Viking raids, which inflicted heavy losses upon England's material and intellectual culture. In England, interest in and the manuscript resources necessary to carry out the study of continental canonical sources would never again under the Anglo-Saxons reach the level they had attained in the first 200 years of the English Church's existence. Following the 8th century, the Anglo-Saxon Church seems to have developed an increasingly strong tradition of operating juridically within the pre-existing secular legal framework. In this tradition which lasted from at least the end of the 9th century until the conquest and beyond the legal and disciplinary spirit of the English Church stood close to and drew support from the emerging strength of West Saxon kingship. Consequently, for the duration of the Anglo-Saxon period continental canon law collections played a correspondingly smaller role in influencing the law and discipline of the Church and its members. But they never became obsolete, and indeed an upsurge of interest in these collections can be seen taking place in the 10th and early 11th centuries. New genres of canonical literature had been gaining in popularity on the continent since the early 9th century. Most important among these, as far as Anglo-Saxon history is concerned, were the large penitential and canonico-penitential collections of the Carolingian period. A number of these collections crossed the channel into England during the 10th century and were well received by the Anglo-Saxon episcopacy. By the beginning of the 11th century, especially with the activities of Abbot Eilfric and Archbishop Wolfstan, study of canon law collections had once again attained a degree of sophistication in England. Nevertheless, despite England's increasingly tight connections to the ecclesiastical traditions of the continent where the study of canon law thrived in the 11th century there are few signs that Eilfric's and Wolfstan's achievements in canonical scholarship were continued by their Anglo-Saxon successors in any significant way. Following the conquest England saw the introduction of Norman libraries and personnel into England, a development that marks a very real terminus to the history of the Anglo-Saxon canonical tradition. The new ecclesiastical reforms and drastically different canonical preoccupations of Archbishop Lanfranc put the study of canon law in England upon entirely new foundations. With the accumulation of new texts and collections, and with the development of new scientific principles for their interpretation, ground was laid for Anglo-Norman England's contribution to the monumental canonical reforms of the 12th century reforms in which the by now long outmoded Anglo-Saxon canonical tradition played almost no part. The most celebrated of the Celtic canonical productions is the Collectio Hibernensis, of the early part of the 8th century, whose compiler put together previous ecclesiastical legislation in 64-69 chapters, preceded by extracts from the Etymologia of St. Isidore of Seville concerning synodal regulations. The preface states that for the sake of brevity and clearness and to reconcile certain juridical antinomies, effort is made to render the sense of the canons rather than their letter. It is a methodical collection to the extent that the matters treated are placed in their respective chapters, but there is much confusion in the distribution of the latter. 
In spite of its defects, this collection made its way into France and Italy and until the 12th century influenced the ecclesiastical legislation of churches in both countries Paul Fournier, de l'influence de la collection irlandaise sur les collections canoniques. Particular collections Apart from the above described general collections there are some special or particular collections that deserve brief mention. Some of them deal with a particular heresy or schism, e.g. the collections of Tours, Verona, Salzburg and Monte Cassino, those of Notre Dame, of Rustines, the Navarro Vaticana and the Codex Encyclius, relative to Eutyches and the Council of Chalcedon, the Veronensis, and the Verdinensis, in the affair of Acacius. Others contain the documents and juridical texts that concern an individual church or country, e.g. the collection of Arles, in which were gathered the privileges of that church, the collections of Lyon, Beauvais, saint Amand, Faycamp etc., in which were brought together the canons of the councils of France. In the same category may be placed the capitula or episcopal statutes, i.e. Decisions and regulations collected from various quarters by local bishops for the use and direction of their clergy see Capitularies, e. g. the Capitula of Theodulf of Orléans, end of the 8th century Patrologia Latina CV, of Hatto of Baal 882, in Mon. Germ. Hist, Leges, 1, 439-41 and of Boniface of Mainz, 745, in Dacheri, Spicelegium, ed. Nova I, 597. Still other collections deal with some special point of discipline. Such are the ancient liturgical collections called by the Greeks, Eucologia, and by the Latins, Libri Mysteriorum, or Sacramentorum, more usually, Sacramentaries. Also since the 8th century the Ordens Romani. Here also belong the collections of ecclesiastical formulae see books of formularies, especially the Liber Diarnus of the Roman Chancery, compiled probably between 685 and 782 Patrologia Latina CV, 11, edited by Garnier Paris, 1680 and anew by M. de Rosiers Paris, 1869 and by T. H. Sickle Vienna, 1889. Special mention is due to the penitential books Libri Poenitentialis, collections of penitential canons, councils and catalogues of ecclesiastical sanctions, to which were gradually added rules for the administration of the sacrament of penance. <laughs> <laughs> collections of ecclesiastico civil laws the civil law as such has no standing in the canonical forum but in her first centuries of existence the Church often rounded out her canonical legislation by adopting certain provisions of the secular laws. Moreover, either by mutual agreement, as under the Carolingian kings, or by the civil power's usurpation of ecclesiastical domain, as frequently happened under the Byzantine emperors, the civil authority legislated on matters in themselves purely canonical, such laws it behooved an ecclesiastic to know. Moreover, the priest often needs some acquaintance with the pertinent civil law in order to decide properly even in purely secular matters that are occasionally submitted to him. Hence the utility of collections of civil laws concerning ecclesiastical matters or the administration of the canonical laws praxis canonica. We have already noted in the East the collections known as nomocanones. The West also had mixed collections of the same nature. Collections of Roman Law this law interested quite particularly the ecclesiastics of the barbarian kingdoms that rose on the ruins of the Western Empire, since they continued to live by it Ecclesia vivit lege romana. .Moreover, apart from the laws of the Anglo-Saxons, the legislation of all the barbarian peoples of Gaul, Spain, and Italy was profoundly influenced by the Roman law, out the Lex Romana Canonis Compta, apparently compiled in Lombardy during the 9th century, and handed down in a manuscript of the Bibliothèque Nationale at Paris. It includes portions of the Institutiones, of the Codex, of Justinian and of the Epitome, of Julian. Capitularies of the Frankish kings. The laws of the latter were very favorable to religious interests, not a few of them were the result of the mutual deliberations of both the civil and the ecclesiastical power. Hence the exceptional authority of the royal capitularies before ecclesiastical tribunals. 
In the first half of the 9th century Ansigasis, abbot of Fontanelles collected in four books capitularies of Charlemagne, Louis the Pious and Lothair I, the first two books contain provisions concerning the «ecclesiastical order», the latter two exhibit the «law of the world». Ansigasis himself added three appendixes. His work was widely used in France, Germany, and Italy, and was quoted in diets and councils as an authentic collection. This rapid sketch exhibits the vitality of the Church from the earliest centuries, and her constant activity for the preservation of ecclesiastical discipline. During this long elaboration, the Greek Church unifies her legislation, but accepts little from beyond her own boundaries. On the other hand, the Western Church, with perhaps the sole exception of Africa, makes progress in the development of local discipline and exhibits an anxiety to harmonize particular legislation with the decretals of the popes, the canons of general councils, and the special legislation of the rest of the Church. Doubtless in the above described collection of canons, the result of this long disciplinary development, we meet with forged decrees of councils and decretals of popes, even with forged collections, e. g. The collections of pseudo-apostolic legislation. Nevertheless, the influence of these apocryphal works on other canonical collections was restricted. The latter were, almost universally, made up of authentic documents. Canonical science in the future would have been nourished exclusively from legitimate sources had not a larger number of forged documents appeared about the middle of the 9th century Capitula of Benedict Levita, Capitula Angelramni, Canons of Isaac of Langra, above all the collection of pseudo-Isidore. See false decretals. But ecclesiastical vigilance did not cease, in the West especially, the Church kept up an energetic protest against the decay of her discipline, witness the many councils, diocesan synods and mixed assemblies of bishops and civil officials, also the numerous over 40 new canonical collections from the 9th to the beginning of the 12th century and whose methodical order foreshadows the great juridical syntheses of later centuries. Being compiled, however, for the most part not directly from the original canonical sources, but from immediately preceding collections, which in turn often depend on apocryphal productions of the 9th century, they appear tainted to the extent in which they make use of these forgeries. Such taint, however, affects the critical value of these collections rather than the legitimacy of the legislation which they exhibit. While the false decretals affected certainly ecclesiastical discipline, it is now generally recognized that they did not introduce any essential or constitutional modifications. They gave a more explicit formulation to certain principles of the constitution of the Church, or brought more frequently into practice certain rules hitherto less recognized in daily use. As to the substance of this long development of disciplinary legislation, we may recognize with Paul Fournier a double current. The German collections, while not failing to admit the rights of the papal primacy, are seemingly concerned with the adaptation of the canons to actual needs of time and place, this is particularly visible in the collection of Burchard of Worms. The Italian collections, on the other hand, insist more on the rights of the papal primacy, and in general of the spiritual power. M. Fournier indicates, as especially influential in this sense, the collection in 74 titles. Both tendencies meet and unite in the works of YVO of Chartres. The compilations of this epoch may, therefore, be classed in these two broad categories. We do not, however, insist too strongly on these views, as yet somewhat provisory, and proceed to describe the principal collections of the next period, following, as a rule, the chronological order. Topic. End of the 9th century to Gratian 1139 Topic. In these two centuries the ecclesiastical authorities were quite active in their efforts to withstand the decay of Christian discipline, the evidence of this is seen in the frequency of councils, mixed assemblies of bishops and imperial officials and diocesan synods whose decrees capitularies were often published by the bishops. In this period many new collections of canons were made, some forty of which, as already said, are known to us. Topic. Collectio Anselmo Dedicata Topic. Its twelve books treat hierarchy, judgments, ecclesiastical persons, spiritual things rules of faith, precepts, sacraments, liturgies and persons separated from the Church. Its sources are the Dionysiana, the Hispania, the correspondence of Gregory I and various collections of civil laws. Unfortunately it has also drawn on pseudo-Isidore. 
It is dedicated to Anselm, doubtless Anselm II of Milan and is held to have been compiled in Italy towards the end of the 9th century. It is certainly anterior to Burchard of Worms 1012 whose work depends on this collection. The author is unknown. Topic. Collection of Regino of Prum Topic. Regino of Prum's work is entitled, De Ecclesiasticis Disciplinis et Religione Christiana, on the discipline of the Church and the Christian religion. According to the preface it was put together by Order of Ratbod, Metropolitan of Trier, as a manual for episcopal use in the course of diocesan visitations. Its two books treat of the clergy and ecclesiastical property viz. of the laity. Each book begins with a list of questions that indicate the points of chief importance in the eyes of the bishop. After this catechism, it adds the canons and ecclesiastical authorities relative to each question. The collection was made about 906 and seems to depend on an earlier one edited by Richter entitled Antiqua Canonum Collectio Qua in Libris de Synodalibus Casus Compilandis Usus Est Regino Prumiensis. Marburg, 1844. The Capitula Abbot Abbo, Abbot of Fleury died 1004, dedicated to Hugh Capet and his son Robert Capet a collection in 56 chapters. It deals with the clergy, ecclesiastical property, monks and their relations with the bishops. Besides the canons and papal decretals, Abbo made use of the capitularies, the Roman civil law, and the laws of the Visigoths. His collection is peculiar in that he enclosed within his own context the texts quoted by him. Topic: The Collectarium Canonum or Libri Decretorum of Burchard of Worms. Topic. This collection in twenty books, often called Brocardus, was compiled by Burchard, an ecclesiastic of Mainz, later Bishop of Worms 1002 at the suggestion of Brunicho, Provost of Worms, and with the aid of Walter, Bishop of Speyer, and the monk Albert. Burchard follows quite closely the following order, hierarchy, liturgy, sacraments, delicts, sanctions and criminal procedure. The 19th book was familiarly known as Medicus or Corrector, because it dealt with the spiritual ailments of different classes of the faithful. It has been edited by Wasserschulben in Bussorningen der Abendlandischen Kirche Leipzig, 1851. The 20th, which treats of providence, predestination and the end of the world, is therefore a theological treatise. The collection, composed between 1013 and 1023 perhaps in 1021 or 1022, is not a mere compilation, but a revision of the ecclesiastical law from the standpoint of actual needs, and an attempt to reconcile various juridical antinomies or contradictions. Burchard is a predecessor of Gratian and, like the latter, was a very popular canonist in his time. He depends on the above-mentioned 9th-century collections and even added to their apocryphal documents and erroneous attributions. The two collections just described Regino and Collectio Anselmo Dedicata were known and largely used by him. Pseudo Isidore also furnished him more than 200 pieces. The entire collection is in Petrologia Latina, CXL. Topic: The Collectio Duodecim Partium. Topic: Yet unedited is by an unknown, probably German author. It includes a great deal of Burchard, follows quite closely his order, and by most is held to have copied his material, though some believe it older than Burchard. The collection in 74 books The collection in 74 books, or Diversorum Sententia Patrum known to the Ballerini brothers and Augustin Tyner, is the subject of a study by Paul Fournier. He considers it a compilation of the middle of the 11th century, done about the reign of Saint Leo IX and in the entourage of that pope and Hildebrand. It was well known in and out of Italy and furnished to other collections not only their general order, but also much of their material. Fournier believes it the source of the collection of Anselm of Lucca, of the Terraconensis and the Polycarpus, also of other collections specified by him. 
Collection of Anselm of Lucca Topic. This collection is divided into 13 books. It is based on Burchard and the Collectio Anselmo Dedicata, and contains many apocryphal pieces and papal decretals not found in other collections. It has no preface. From the beginning of a Vatican manuscript, it is clear that Anselm of Lucca compiled the work during the pontificate and by order of Pope Gregory VII. Died 1085. It passed almost entire into the Decretum of Gratian. Topic. Collection of Cardinal Dusdetit Topic. Cardinal Dusdetit was enabled to use the correspondence registrum of Pope Gregory VII, also the Roman archives. His work is dedicated to Pope Victor III 1086 the successor of Gregory, and dates therefore from the reign of Victor. Its four books on the papal primacy, the Roman clergy, ecclesiastical property and the patrimony of Peter, reflect the contemporary anxieties of the papal entourage during this phase of the conflict of investiture between the Church and the Holy Roman Empire. Topic. Collection of Bonizo Topic. Bonizo, Bishop of Sutri near Piacenza, published, apparently a little later than 1089, a collection in ten books preceded by a brief preface which treats successively the catechism and baptism, then the duties of divers classes of the faithful, ecclesiastical rulers and inferior clergy, temporal authorities and their subjects, finally of the cure of souls and the penitential canons. The fourth book only De Excellentia Ecclesia Romanae has found an editor, Cardinal Mai, in the seventh volume of his Nova Bibliotheca Patrum, Rome, 1854. The Polycarpus A collection in eight books so called by its author, Gregory, Cardinal of San Crisogono, Q. V., and dedicated to Diego Gelmirez, Archbishop of Compostela, of whose name only the initial D is given, also known as Didicus, he was archbishop of that see from 1101 to 1120, which is therefore the approximate date of the Polycarpus, now given as around 1113. It depends on Anselm of Lucca and on the Collectio Anselmo Dedicata, and the above-mentioned collection in 74 books. The author, however, must have had access to the Roman archives. Topic. Collection of YVO of Chartres Topic. YVO of Chartres exercised a pronounced influence on the development of canon law he died 1115 or 1117. We owe to Paul Fournier a study of his juridical activity, he has left us the Decretum a vast repertory in 17 parts and 3,760 chapters, though roughly subdivided under the aforesaid 17 rubrics, its contents are thrown together without order and seemingly represent undigested results of the author's studies and researches, hence it has been surmised that the Decretum is a mere preparatory outline of the Panermia. See below, its material in the rough. Tyner does not admit that the Decretum is the work of YVO, it is, nevertheless, generally accepted that YVO is the author, or at least that he directed the compilation. Nearly all of Burchard is found therein, and in addition a host of canonical texts, also Roman and Frankish law texts gathered from Italian sources. Fournier dates it between 1090 and 1095. It is found in Petrologia Latina CLXI. The Panermia, admittedly a work of YVO. It is much shorter than the Decretum, having only eight books, and is also more compact and orderly. Its material is taken from the Decretum, but it offers some additions, particularly in the third and fourth books. It seems to have been composed about 1095, and appears at that time as a kind of methodical summa of the canon law, with Burchard it divided popularity in the next fifty years, i.e., until the appearance of the Decretum of Gratian. The Tripartita so called because of its triple division, contains in its first part papal decretals as late as Urban II died 1099, and is therefore not of later date. Its second part offers canons of the councils after the Hispania text, the third part contains extracts from the Fathers and from the Roman, and the Frankish law. Topic. Diverse collections 
Topic. All three of these above described collections decretum, panermia, tripartita called for and found abridgments. Moreover, new collections arose, owing to fresh additions to these major compilations and new combinations with other similar works. Among them are the Caesaragastana, so called because found in a Spanish Carthusian monastery near Zaragoza. It seems to have been compiled in Aquitaine and contains no papal decretals later than Paschal II died 1118, which suggests its composition at a previous date. Its fifteen books borrow much from the Decretum of YVO of Chartres. The Collection in Ten Parts compiled in France between 1125 and 1130, an enlarged edition of the Panermia. The Summa Decretorum of Hamo, Bishop of Chalon sur Marne 1153, an abridgment of the preceding. Antonius Augustinus, who made known in the 16th century the Caesaragastana, revealed also the existence of the Terraconensis, which came to him from the Spanish Cistercian Monastery of Ploblit, near Tarragona in six books. It has no documents later than the reign of Gregory VII died 1085 and belongs therefore to the end of the 11th century, the Correctors Romani, to whom we owe 1572 the official edition of the Corpus Juris Canonici, made use of the Terraconensis. Topic. See also Topic. Collectiones Canonum Dionysianae, Collectio Canonum Quasnelliana, Collectio Canonum Quadripartita Collectio Canonum Wigorniensis, Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, Penitential, Libellus Responsinum. Topic Notes. Topic. Topic References. Topic. Topic Bibliography Topic Topic Further reading Topic Catholic Encyclopedia article This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Herbermann, Charles, ed. 1913. Article name needed. Catholic Encyclopedia. New York, Robert Appleton. 